Capture the Passion. Welcome to Capture the Passion, a podcast for the Community Partnership for Teachers Pipeline. CPTP is an initiative to build a community-based teacher pipeline that strengthens the teaching profession by increasing the number of teachers of color. Why, you ask? Well, research shows that having a same-race teacher significantly improves student outcomes and reduces disparities between students of color and white students. Essentially, building a diverse teaching workforce representative of student demographics in the communities improves education. But that's easier said than done. How does CPTP do it? Well, we identify, recruit, train, and support prospective teachers within historically under-resourced schools and communities. Addressing the structural inequalities of historically under-resourced schools and communities starts with an IDEA. IDEA is an acronym for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. IDEA highlights efforts towards underserved communities by addressing structural inequalities. These may include examining the role privilege plays in students' academic success, or learning strategies to create accessible documents for students of varying abilities or even providing a space for students to voice their experiences and connect their learning to their lives. Organizations that embrace IDEA, such as CPTP, are able to foster cultures that minimize bias and recognize and address systemic inequalities, which, if unaddressed, create disadvantage for certain individuals or groups. In today's episode, we're going to examine how current and future educators can learn to be an advocate for inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. In other words, we're gonna give you a good idea. Have you ever thought of teaching? Hello, my name is Leah Martinez. I am your interim project manager and director of the Community Partnerships for Teacher Pipeline, or CPTP at Rio Hondo College. CPTP's mission is to increase the number of teachers of color. Our goal is to recruit 100 students or more and match them with teachers who have already gone through the pipeline to inspire, motivate, and support students like you who are interested in exploring or pursuing a teaching career. CPTP offers wraparound student support and services, including a dedicated mentor, a student success coach, and a stipend pay if you complete the program's requirements. This project is supported by the U.S. Department of Education's Supporting Effective Educator Development, or SEED grant, in partnership with the Center for Collaborative Education, along with two other community colleges, Cerritos College and El Camino College. Interested? Go to our website at www.riohondo.edu slash iteach to follow the two-step process to apply or simply scan this QR code. Hey everybody, Alex here, and welcome to Capture the Passion. For those of you who don't know, Capture the Passion is a podcast for CPTP, the Community Partnership for Teachers Pipeline. If you've never listened to this before, or if you don't know what that is, CPTP is an initiative to build a community-based teacher pipeline that strengthens the teaching profession by increasing the number of teachers of color. The reason why is because research shows that having same race teachers significantly improves student outcomes and reduces disparities between students of colors and white students. So in essence, building a diverse teaching workforce representative of the student demographics in the communities improves education. With us today, we have an educator in the LA area, Jorge Ramirez. Jorge, do you mind introducing yourself and letting us know what you do and how long you've been teaching in the field? Oh, thank you for letting me be here. It's a blessing to be here and share some of my experience. Uh, I grew up, actually I was born in Mexico. I came into this country illegally. And my family, we struggled a lot. Um, eventually settled in East L.A. Um, as an educator now, I reflect a lot on my public school system and how much it could have done much better. And now as an educator, I see and I reflect on the areas where I lacked as a student, and now what I can do different as an educator. As an educator, I teach preschool, uh, children's three, four, and five-year-old, which is just amazing. I mean, I, I always say I get paid to be a kid. <laughs> you can't beat that. Uh, I also teach at East LA College and Cal State LA. I teach in the child development field, and it all, it all comes together for me. And 
a full-time job working with preschool children and then going to work with future teachers, it just gives me that opportunity to teach. So you're getting that perspective from both sides. I do, yes. I My do. goodness. I would love to say I, I, uh, I feel the same way when it comes to working with uh, kids. Like if I'm a, I'm a student as well, like working with college kids, um, sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes I feel like I'm just an adult babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> A oh, very man. expensive. Yeah, place. very expensive. One. It is so weird <laughs> how all three of us, as male educators, have different experiences. Because I also teach at the college, specifically the community college area, and I chose to teach at the community college level because I didn't want to work with kids. I like working with adults because I like being able to yell at adults. So when <laughs> adults like mess up, I'll tell them, "You got a zero out here because you didn't turn it in on time, or you got a zero because, dude, you plagiarized, or you just write like crap." I don't know. After the after these past two years, it's been really interesting becoming an elementary school teacher, because my son is in the first grade, and throughout the pandemic, you know, he's on the he was he was on the virtual class for about one hour, and then the rest of the day, I was his teacher. <laughs> like this is so the amount of patience that you have to have, right? I would say from pre K all the way up to what maybe ninth grade uh, with, with these students is. Uh, tremendous you'd have to have a tremendous amount of uh, patience because just my son by himself I was kind of pulling my hair out see I don't have right. any more so. <laughs> <laughs> so you said uh like being a pre-k teacher is like being a kid like what's the joy from being a pre-k teacher the way that I see it I, I look at it from a long-term perspective I'm working with children and I get to I have an opportunity to change their cultural norms I have an opportunity well not change but influence it I have an opportunity to cultivate a passion for education, uh, children to be able to grow up and be critical thinkers and analyze data. Um, one of the struggles that I had growing up was getting this knowledge in first through the 12th grade. Uh, I didn't go to kindergarten for whatever reason. And not understanding why things were happening in a certain way. And when I questioned them, not to be disrespectful, but it was more of like, well, that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, many people call me George, and it's Jorge. It's so, for the record, I corrected yeah. everyone in here. <laughs> yeah, because right. I said, I, call, I, I called you George. So, what, um, when, when I, we settled in East LA, I went to uh, Malabar Elementary, and I was excited to go to school. I, I couldn't wait to go to school. I wanted to learn English. I didn't know a word in English. My parents didn't know a word in English. Um, when eventually I got to first grade, I remember the teacher asking me for my name, and I didn't know what she was talking about. I just remember looking at her and looking at the class, and everybody's looking at me, and I just said, see. Sí. And the class starts laughing. So, you know, she looks at me, and she's like, ha, ha, ha. And she's pointing her finger at me and asking, ah. I'm like, I would imagine it's got to feel like that Charlie Brown, right? Where it's like, womp, womp, exactly. womp, womp. And you're just, just like, like that. Yeah, because you don't know what she's saying. And we had an assistant in the class that uh -huh. spoke Spanish, but she never came over to help out. It was, um, it was one of my peers that came over and said, oh, you know, she's asking for your name. So this, time, this, this exchange happened about three times. So I told her, I said, oh, me llamo Jorge. Uh -huh. Like it wasn't a big deal. And she looked at me and she said, you know, again, womp, 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 womp. Yeah. She got a pencil and she crossed it out and she said, "You, George. Oh wow. You know Jorge. Oh wow. What the f? And she, you know, elementary schools. There's a U.S. flag and she said, "You know Mexico. You USA." Oh wow. What? To me, that that she took away my culture. She Wait, took away. What year is this? This was. I don't want to. I don't mean to date you here, but <laughs> no, no, it's yeah. all good. This was. Um, he was in first grade. Probably early '80s. I want to say. Early '80s. Early wow. Early 80s, yeah. And um, being in East LA at that time it was predominantly Latino. Yeah, yeah. You know, it um, still is. But I think right now yeah. it, it, it still is. But going back to the point of what TPTP is all about, I, I didn't have a teacher that mm -hmm. made that connection with me. The, the teacher assistants were. It's all. It's just right now they're just trying to strip your, strip you of who you are, your identity. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's what it was. So to me, um, it's sort of like a trigger when people call me George. But you know, I, I start off and say, no, it's not. It's nothing personal because. They don't understand mm -hmm. where, where I'm coming from. So it's like, you know, I politely will, if anybody calls me George, it's like, oh, hi, it's Jorge. Yes. Um, but I had to reflect on that when I, um, when I had to do my uh, thesis for one of my classes at grad school. Uh, most perplexed experience as a student. So I wrote about that. And the more that I wrote about it, the more I remembered. And I remember just 
I'm even getting chills right now. I remember. I was what, thinking because when you do that, that type of reflex, the, the reflective writing, right? You, 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 those emotions never go away, especially if you haven't handled them, right? right? If you haven't dealt with them, seen them face to face. So now you're you're drawing them up, and you're going through all this as an adult, kind of reflecting on that. Right. My gosh, it was tough. It yeah. was really tough to the point that um, when eventually I finished writing, I said to myself, "This was before I, I got the opportunity to teach um, the college level." I said, "You know, if if I get to that point." I need to make sure that this doesn't happen, not in my classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, applying that to young children, giving them their identity, making them feel proud about their identity so they can have a self-efficacy that they they're, they feel good about themselves. You know, uh, I remember that first grade year for me, I hated going to school. Mm-hmm. I would come up with a million excuses why not, why not to go to school. And, you know, my late dad, my mom were like, you got to go to school. This is why we came here. You got to go to school. Um, now with my preschool children, it's I gotta give them a reason to come to school. You know, you you want to come to school, and most of the time they're happy to be there at school. Some, many times they don't want to go home. That's and, awesome. And th- yeah. That's always a good thing. Well, what do you think the difference is between now and then? Because I remember earlier you said that when you're growing up, having first gone to school, yeah, you were really excited about it. But then as you're in school, you find reasons to not go. And even at the beginning, you sort of hinted at not having had the best experience. What do you think the difference is between the quality of education back in the day when you were a kid versus the quality of education your kids are getting right now? It comes down to making connections, making deep connections, relationships, meaningful relationships. That's not just about me knowing your favorite color, your favorite number, your favorite food to eat, but actually knowing how you learn, understanding your learning style, and me as a facilitator of your learning help you, scaffold you to get to that point where you're creating new knowledge. To me as an educator, uh, especially in the preschool field, I get called a babysitter. I get called a, you know, you're just a child care worker. I say, call me whatever you want. I'm an educator. I advocate for young children. I want them to get a better education than I ever got. The biggest difference that I see with my whole experience, um, first through 12th grade, is that I strive to build those relationships. I mean, I, honestly, I can name one teacher that I had a really good connection with, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, I believe he passed not long ago. He was the, the only male teacher I had. And it, it shocks me when I ask my students um, at the college level, how many teachers did you have that actually made an impact on you? The most I've gotten in a class is three. And I said, wow. Some of them will say, well, you know what? Um, at a college level, it's different. I said, well, it, college level is different, but I want to know your K-12, um, what yeah. was it like? And the that's kind of what shapes you, right? Yeah. Exactly. 12, yeah. Yeah. I think that sets the stage. And I think for me, choosing to go with preschool, early childhood education, it's this is the foundation. Mm-hmm. Yep. So if I can give them an opportunity to make a connection with their teacher, then I'm setting a pretty solid foundation into what their education is going to be like. So, so what are some tactics that you utilize in the classroom to create more inclusivity, to, to build this for your students? My whole philosophy re- revolves around a theoretical perspective. Okay. It's understanding theory, understanding attachment. That's my area of research. And, I mean, we're, t- but we're, talk- we're talking about, what, like five-year-olds, right? <laughs> We have, so, them, we have them citing theory. I mean, okay. I want to go to this classroom, right? <laughs> Let's go. It's, um, so it, it's more of my theoretical approach to them. Okay. Um, first and foremost is building that emotional bond. You feel secure with me. This is a safe place, not mm-hmm. just the environment, but with me. Um, many times uh, I've worked with teachers in many school districts um, that they see a child walking by with their shoelaces untied and don't even acknowledge it. Something as tiny their shoelace as getting a tissue to wipe their, their nose or taking them to a restroom, allowing them to go to the restroom for crying out loud. It's what makes them feel like, oh, here's someone that cares. Yeah. Playing with them, um, getting on the tricycles, going down the, uh, the slide, getting in the sandbox, getting dirty, getting paint in your clothes. Playing. Early childhood education is about playing. When we as educators inject ourselves into their play, because that's how they learn, then they see you different. They sort of build this relationship with you where it's like, here's someone that's not just telling me what to do, what to do, or how to do it, but it's actually part of my learning. So then they'll come to me, they'll ask me questions. I ask them questions. I, I don't like giving them a direct answer. It's more of like, hmm, why do you think that's happening? Gotcha. Mm. To, kind of, to kind of spur the, the thoughts, right? The and thought the crazy, process. the crazy part too is everything that you're saying is all like not only founded in solid education theory, but that also applies 
even at the college level for adult learners. Yes. Like I think uh, for those of you listening, in education, we use a term called pedagogy, and that's sort mm -hmm. of the science of how you teach kids, how do you teach young people. On the opposite spectrum of that, we have a concept called andragogy, if I'm remembering, yes, remembering yeah. correctly. It's how do adult learners learn? Or how do you teach adult learners? And between young learners and older learners, the principles are the same. You have to be in there with them. You have to have a good relationship with them. Students need to be able to see you working with them they need to see that you are part of their learning process rather than the formula of education we have now of sit down, read, mm -hmm. listen, take a test, and then rinse and repeat. Because right. in our education system, we try to, it's like it's very industrialized versus meaningful education is exactly what Jorge is talking about. I yeah. think it's so crazy. You're talking about all the stuff you do with like, kids between like three to five years old this is how we teach people like 20 years old and 40 I mean, years it's, old it's 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 the acknowledgement right yeah. it's the acknowledgement and it's the attention because even children at a young age they may not be receiving that in the household right. right so then they have an opportunity to go and explore that but then on the flip side of that i mean in my classroom sometimes every now and then i'll stamp their work right so i'll have like a one of my son's stamps it's a star right <laughs> and i'll stamp it and then i give it to them and they laugh but then when I don't do it, they're like, oh, you're not going to stamp this one? Because they really liked getting the stamp. They really like getting that acknowledgement, you know? So it's like, yeah, they are. They are very similar. And as human beings, that's what we want. We want to be acknowledged. Yes. You know, we want to be respected. We want to be validated. Mm -hmm. it, it works with young children just as much as it does with the older college students. And it works with us ourselves, too. You know, your partner, you acknowledge your partner. Then it, you have a different relationship than when you don't. <laughs> I'm guilty of that many times. But as, as you learn through it, you... It's, it becomes more peaceful because working with children, when they come to you and they know that here's someone that genuinely cares about me, then you can teach them the world and they will understand it. It's that relationship. Um, and many times I've seen individuals where they talk to children instead of talking with children. Learning is about learning together. You know, here's, here's what it is. Why do you think it works this way? And then to hear a three, four, and five year old their perspective, it's like, wow, that's deep. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even think about it that way. Yeah, it's like that. Have you seen that YouTube video of like an eight year old explaining his relationship with God? And I'm not a religious person, by the way, but it's this eight year old, and it's like this two minute clip of him talking about how uh, he, the, this kid who's like eight years old, makes an analogy of ants. In the same way ants are to us as we are to God, this kid has this, this really deep and profound understanding of his faith and his understanding of a higher power in relation to like himself and his family and everything. And it's like, wow, you would. this eight-year-old speaks better faith, I think, than some adults or some religious leaders even discuss faith. And it's like normally, if we listen to kids, it's, we would never hear that stuff unless we give them the chance to talk. Right. And, and they enjoy telling you their perspective. They yeah. enjoy saying, oh, you know, this is the way that I see the world. And as I reflect on things, it's like, dang, you're absolutely right. Like, so yesterday, in regards to, to ants, we noticed that there was a lot of ants in, our, in one of our pots. And one of the children said, they're probably looking for food and maybe they want to eat the caterpillars. And I said, well, where are the caterpillars? And he said, look. Remember yesterday the monarch was flying around the milkweed? And I said, yeah, I remember seeing the, the monarch. And he said, well, here are the eggs. And there was three eggs. So this morning, we, we took those um, leaves, put them inside. This morning, two caterpillars were out. Wow. And, oh. and the, way, the way the child is explaining the way this happens, it's like, wow. I, I thought it was just from the egg to the caterpillar to the chrysalis to the butterfly, and that's it. But his whole deep perspective into it, it's like, not only am I teaching you, but I'm also learning how to be a better teacher because I see where your interest is and I can build on that. And that's the biggest component into building relationships where I'm listening to you. I'm here. Yeah. I'm present. I'm not just here telling you again what to do and to do how to do it. But you're you're empowering them. Right. It's, and that's so, that's so strong, right? Because sometimes the teachers feel like they are the ones that have to know everything right. and you have to be open and willing. Good. That's a great point. Well, let me see something because I actually... I've never ever considered like teaching kids before, but as a college teacher, I have curriculum to cover. And this question is more about to you and sort of like your professional duties. Like, is there stuff you have to teach your kids or is it just like, oh, they're just in the room with you and you have to make sure that none of them die? 
<laughs> that's one of the biggest responsibilities. That's, a, that's in the rule book, right? right. Page six, no one dies. And then you go to page seven. <laughs> you know, the, the thing about early childhood education is that it's, it's based on play, yeah, in theory. Um, uh, the district that I work for is very, they have a very rigorous curriculum and it's pretty much broken down to a T where it can get very frustrating. And um, we experience a lot of turnover ratio because it burns you out. It burns you out where you're, you're reading a book and it tells you spend the next 15 minutes doing these things. But then you have Jorjito who's struggling with it. And it's like, sorry, Jorjito, it's 15 minutes are we got to move on. Um, for me, what has worked for me is knowing how to scaffold them properly and being able to extend activities. Okay. So here's, here's a curriculum that's given to me. The curriculum is just my tools. And this tool, I'm going to build an empire around the child. I'm not going to say this is the curriculum and this is what we're going to stand for. It's these are my tools to get you above and beyond wherever it is that you want to go. Uh, building on the child's interest is always fascinating because you hear their different perspective. As I'm getting your interest, now I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to plug the curriculum into that interest and then make it meaningful to you where you're actually learning? Um, early childhood education also focuses on milestones. You know, children need to reach certain milestones, uh, whether it be socially, emotionally, academically, physically. So understanding those milestones and understanding the curriculum and understanding the different types of learners we have, putting it all that together makes it work. It, it, it's doable. Many people will say education is probably the easiest profession you, go, you can go into. Education is rocket science. Yeah, you know? I was going to say, I don't know about those many people. <laughs> I mean, like, 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 the people who think it's easy are the people who don't put the work into it. Like, uh, like, like there, are, there are textbook teachers. Right. Because I've had students even at, uh, in college complain that some of their teachers, and again, I think this goes back to your thing on how it can be very difficult and get a lot of burnout when you have, when teachers are given sort of a prescription of what to teach students. And I have some colleagues and some of, my te- and some of my students have even complained. They've had some teachers at a college level course in which students are supposed to be able to think out of the box and do discussions where their teacher will just say things from a chapter for 45 minutes right. and then give them a quiz in the last 20 minutes. And then, okay, your homework is to give me a summary of what, this, what was in the chapter or what was in the lecture. And it's a lot of just very droll, very boring Nothing that stimulates the mind, right. and I can see why. Like it could be really frustrating because even at the, at the college level, it's oh, there's this curriculum, but I disagree with a lot of it. I was like, sometimes I'll just teach three or four chapters all at once, just because I want to get them done with and give. Okay, now next class we right. can have a discussion. And see the, the I, I would call that the cookie cutter approach. So here's here's a one size fits all, mm-hmm. and when you take that route, you sort of you desensitize students from education, from learning. And now education is just a matter of you tell me what to do. When, as I'm hearing you say that, I, I think back to how some of my college students struggle with the work that I give them. And the work that I give them is a reflective journal. And they will complain. Well, here, here's the criteria. The criteria is that it needs to be on one page. And it's like, it's a piece of cake. And I said, it's not gonna be a piece of cake. It's about reflection, right? Because like you said, most, especially my education was, here's a book, read it, here's a quiz, and then write about it, and then you're done with it. Nothing to think outside the box. There was no critical thinking involved in there. There was no analyzing of anything. It was more of like, this is what it is, and you just regurgitate it back to me. And if you can regurgitate it in a way that I think you pass, then you're good. Yeah. As opposed to, you know what, tell me what you think. And doing that at a very young age with preschool children, allowing them to tell you what they think, it's fascinating when you're like, you know, and many times I've been caught where I'm like, dude, I didn't even think about that. Like, man, I, was, I just look, looking at myself like, did you hear what he said? Man, Jorjito, he's got it down. At the college level, when, when I, I tell them, you guys all think that, oh, you know, I hear about Mr. Ramirez and he seems to be very cool because he can connect to us teaching at East LA College and Cal State LA. Being Latino, we, we make that connection, right? Yeah. When I start giving them the work, then it's like, man, you know, I cried doing this reflective journal because I had to go back and think about my education. And here I am carrying all this emotional load and having the opportunity to articulate it in a very academic manner. 
helped me understand why I am the way I am today. And that's what child development did for me. That's the reason why. And it was an, um, an elective for me, too. I'm like, oh, I'll take child development, piece of cake. And I'm sitting there like, oh, my goodness. Like, this is why I am the way I am today. Giving, the, giving students an opportunity at a very young age, which I didn't have, I think will cultivate a, a culture of critical thinking, of analyzing, of being able to think on your own, more importantly, not just this is the way education is and this is the way it has to be because I remember many times, like I said, you know, questioning teachers when they're like, you know what, you know what, George, that's the way it is. And it's like, I hear you, however, I just have a question. You're just too difficult. Like, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm trying to understand. Yeah. Well, Lilith, I like how you said that. But now, how would you get more male teachers? Because I know that you said, like, in the same way you took child development as an elective, I also did it. And then I dropped that class because, like, it was, I was only male in the class. And I was like, okay, I don't feel that this class is for me. And especially since earlier you said that, you know, you're one of the few male teachers in the profession and how you're sort of given looks or people think about you in certain ways because of that. How do we encourage more men to not only be more teachers, but also to even maybe become teachers in childhood development? And also, is it significant? Do we really need more men in that field? I think so. I think there, there's a lot of research that says children that have a positive male role model at a young age. Mm -hmm are less likely to be influenced by gangs, by drugs, by peer pressure. Right. Um, and, and we could go into those numbers into saying that most of the gang members are men. Yeah. Most of the gang members that use drugs don't have a positive male role, mo role model in their early childhood years. So to break that cycle, you obviously you need to have positive male role models. Um, in my, I've been, I've been in the education field for 22 years and I think I have been the only male teacher in three, yeah, in three schools that I've worked at, I was the only male teacher. And You're like a unicorn! <laughs> well, like, whatever the three version of a unicorn is. It's, it's scary, and I think to get more men in the field, we need to break the culture of teaching. Yeah. I, I think that a lot of times it's, um, oh, you're going to be a teacher, you're not going to make enough money. So as a man, why don't you go into engineering? And it's, if you come into the education, you need to understand that you're going to be compensated very well if you don't stick in the classroom. You know, you got to be willing to go out there and you got to be willing to network and mentor right. other people to give them the perspective of teaching. Teaching is awesome. There's a lot of challenges being a male teacher in the early childhood education field because, you know, you get the dads coming in and asking, wait, you're going to take care of my, my daughter? that needs to use the restroom and you're going to be there watching yeah. her. It's like, well, and to me, it's like, this is, this is a perfect learning experience. It's not watching, it's supervision. You know, I, I need to make sure your child is properly supervised. It, I sort of see that as a way, and this is what I tell my, my male students is, this is an opportunity for you to shine, for you to show them that you're not just there by mistake, but you're there because you want to be there. You understand child development. You understand the theories. You know how to develop children individually. And that's what you talk to them, you let them know. Helping, helping men understand that early childhood education is teaching is bringing them in the classroom and seeing how fun it is. Where you're working with little kids and they admire you, they look up to you, they want to always <laughs> please you and, and show you how cool they are. Um, to me right now, I have a student who just started this week and he noticed my shoes. He said, oh look teacher, we have the same. And I said, you know what, we do have the same. So the next day, he, the first thing he did uh, when he walked in, he came up to me and he said, hi. And he looked at my shoes. And it was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> and I said, well, let me see your shoes. Mm. So I waved by to the parents and they're like, you know, like all nervous. You know, is he going to cry? Is he going to be okay? And so we kept that conversation going. And that was our connection. To, to have that connection with young children is very gratifying for men um, because you have the power to change society. Yeah, you, you know, do. You have the power to say, hey, you know what? If you're not happy with society, because I'm, I'm not, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, don't, I can't think of one person that says that they are, 
this is where you impact change. It's interesting, though, because so there's two things. Two things. One is the first says I was that parent that when my son would go into preschool, I, I would be sitting there waiting to see if he's going to cry, and then my head would just be in the window the whole time. <laughs> so if all the teachers and the students looked up, they would just see me just floating there, right? And there was one time where he was just like, go. Get out of here, right? Um, that was me. So I just wanted to you know, put that out there because I'm pretty sure you probably deal with that on the regular, right? Uh, but the second is I feel like uh, the, when we talk about male teachers, right, especially um, at the younger grade levels, it's almost like um, there's a gender inequality here mm-hmm. because it's almost assumed that these are positions primarily for women, right? Just like a, the, just like a nurse, right? With male nurses we're seeing being more and more common now. But – I wonder how much this even crosses, right, just cultural stereotypes because, you know, coming from Hispanic backgrounds, you know, we're often taught at a very young age that a man's job is to get their hands dirty, right? right? That you have to go and when you come home, you should be doing some type of backbreaking work, right? I remember when I was uh, in my early 20s, right, there was one of my uh, girl I was dating at the time. Um, she would tell me and I'd, I'd say, oh, I'm tired today, right? But uh, I was working as a financial advisor and she's like, your, your work is not stressful, right? How, are you, how can you be tired, right? I'm like, because I'm tired because I've been dealing with clients and this and that. Yeah, but you don't, you're not physically tired. Like, your job isn't demanding. And we actually got into an argument because I don't do backbreaking work, right? And I thought that this was fascinating to me because I'm like, so I can't be tired, right? Like, my job can't tire me no, out. you're not doing a manly job. Exactly right? was the point, right? Is the point. And, you know, with Hispanic communities, like that, that is big, right? The gender roles are big. You should play into that role. So how do we break that? How do we even think about breaking that? You know, funny you say that. My, my late father, he would, he, t- he would tell me a lot um, there's there's eight of us, mm-hmm. and I'm the second oldest. And he would tell me like, you know, mijo, venimos para que no trabajes con tu cuerpo. Mm-hmm. You came to the U.S. so yes. you don't work with your body. He goes, I want I want you to work with your mind. I want you to think about things. And my dad, this is the conversation that I miss um, having him around now. I, we'd get into deep conversations, and he would say like, you know, you got to keep going. There's no way that you can say like. You can't come home tired and say you didn't work. You have to know that you, what your work is meaningful. And if you can always help someone else, you have to be willing to help them. And he would say, you know, for you, you're helping kids. He goes, I never had that. And in, in our culture, in the Mexican culture, very traditional machista culture, mm-hmm. really didn't get that. But my dad thought different. And his whole thing was, you have to be willing to change. So I think to break that is... I have that opportunity. I'm blessed with that opportunity to work with young children, to work with college students and let them know, like, hey, you know what? This is actually really good. Um, We had a a workshop a while back. I was presenting the workshop and I always, and it's via Zoom and I always like going through the names. And there's probably like, out of the 43 that were in there, I counted three men names. And it's like, you know, okay. That's a start, right? (laughs) That's a start. We're getting better. (laughs) <laughs> We're getting better. I think how, how we continue that is we advocate, those of us that have that platform to advocate, to bring in more people in this position, you know, we use that and we say, you know what, this is actually very significant. It's very meaningful. And it's not just about the hard labor, physical labor. Yeah. It's it's beyond that. Uh, for us to have a platform where we say, you know what, we're we're working with generations ahead of us and we're educated. That's a big start, I think. So you are the physical embodiment of the cure. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> it's about representation, right? It is. No, it's funny that because um, I remember when you said on how like you'd have a parent who'd be worried about oh take a little girl. I remember before I became a college teacher, I was an instructional assistant. That's how sort of how I got into education because I was very lucky enough to after having graduated high school, my high school was like oh hey Alex, like do you want to like work for us? Like like we know you're doing tutoring at the school and everything. One of the hardest things I had to deal with that nobody had trained me for was I had to supervise eighth graders, and one of the girls in, in the class had her first period, and I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll just go to the bathroom. Don't worry. Like, don't worry, sweetie. Like, don't worry, sweetie. I will go there. We're going to like, one of your friends. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to find one of the uh, like one of the female teachers. <laughs> Give me, like, 30 seconds. I, would, I just ran down. I was like, oh, uh, hey. Hey, Laura, do you mind coming over here for like a minute? A student, a female student is having a problem, and I didn't know like what to do with it. Uh, that, so, yes. That's culture, though, too, right? It, it's um, Culture says that sex is taboo. 
um, culture, we don't talk about our organs. We don't talk about how our bodies are changing. We don't talk about what the girls are doing or what the boys are doing. Yeah. You know, they, we sort of assume that if you're a girl, then you go with your mom. Um, I just need to watch the new movie Turning Red. I think that's <laughs> it. It's pretty good. I yeah. actually saw this past weekend. Yeah. I've heard of it. I didn't get the chance to see it. Yeah, me neither. I stopped watching. Apparently, that's sort of, and I yes. know this is sort of like a weird segue where this conversation is going, oh, just about periods now. Probably shouldn't have said it like that. Right? But yeah, Turning Red is a sort of uh, yeah, the, about The that. Turning Red kind of threw me for a loop. I'm like, what? what, what? That's what it's about? <laughs> uh, apparently, or something like that. It's about like a girl who turns into like a red panda. And I okay. think it's about puberty. Got you. Like, Metaphor, you know, yeah. kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. Move on. Uh, Move on. Okay. So speaking of representation, since you are sort of the embodiment of how we get more men in education, we need to have more male educators who encourage men in classes to get into education. And like you said, it's also like breaking the stereotypes. Do you think there's a way we do that, like, in pop culture to sort of mm -hmm. get guys more into education? Like, is there, like, a movie that you know of or any, like, TV show that, like, might get, like, more men into teaching? This podcast. This is where we start, right? This oh, my start. God, that was a great... <laughs> that's the mic drop right yeah, there. Yeah, that's the mic drop right this there. This is where we start, and we, we say that we as three mm -hmm. men that are educators in the education field is we let them know how gratifying it is. I think a lot of times education is frowned upon by men because we think that it's not going to be a good enough job to provide for our families. And when, that's the nail on the head right there, yeah. especially for, for coming from the Hispanic culture, right? Right, like, exactly. You yeah. feel that burden to have to provide. Oh, yes. Oh, right? yeah. I, have a, yeah. I have a friend who is of Hispanic descent, and he's proud because he does. He has a little girl. He does not want his like, little girl to be a teacher, um, uh, and on career day, like the teacher asked all the, all the kids what they want to be. And his daughter said, the only thing I know I want to be is not a teacher. Cause my dad says teachers don't make any money. And apparently the teacher cried after hearing that. And my friend was so proud about his daughter making the statement against being a teacher and then making the teacher cry because it just validated what he had to say. Oh, wow. but, for, it, but it's exactly what you're saying. Like, yeah. It's about, he come from a culture where it's about, um, Ha having financial stability and having sort of like better things to do and for him it's like no like he does like finance or something like that yeah but if, if you th if you think about it i think being an educator um you can be financially well -loved. yeah and that's where i don't understand the this this kind of misconception about teacher pay because right. The teachers make good money. Oh yeah, right. I mean, in California. early early on in your career, you don't. But I mean, you stick around long enough, and <laughs> you have a pretty cushy lifestyle. And, and I think it also has to do with you not just being stuck in the classroom. Um, I understand. Yes, it's it's very stressful, and most of the time we take our work home, yeah. mm -hmm. right? As teachers, so yeah. why don't we make something with that? Especially now with technology, make a YouTube video about how to teach children. Make a YouTube about how to engage them, how to get their attention, how to develop open-ended questions. Come to a podcast and yeah. share your knowledge with people so they can say, like, hey, you know what? There's actually um, not to get off topic, but growing up, as I mentioned, you know, we, we struggled a lot. We were on food stamps. We were on welfare. And now I am blessed that every April 15th, Uncle Sam takes a really good chunk out of my <laughs> taxes. And um, my girl's mom, Rosa, she's always like, Jorge, you got to stop doing these things because, you know, you're going to pay more. You're going to pay more. And I tell her, look. I'm blessed, yes. we're blessed to have two girls that didn't know what poverty is. Mm. I'm an educator. Yeah. And to say that my girls can have literally everything, anything they want, it's a blessing. But that's not the way it's seen in society. Society is like, oh, you're teaching, you're not going to make much money. Well, if you stay stuck in where you're at, then you're not going to make much money no matter where you go. It's always about wanting to get better, wanting to share your knowledge. And I strongly believe my dad would always say, you know, if you can help, help, and help is going to come right back to you. Yeah. Um, this mentor program, um, CPTP, has helped me come here and talk to you guys. has helped me do workshops where I was able to network with people across the state. Um, where it's, it, had I, my mentality had been, I'm a teacher and I'm just in this classroom, I would have never gotten to that point. I am blessed to be a mentor teacher um, for Cal State LA, first generation students. USC for the Alumni Latino Association and their first generation students. I'm blessed to be here, CPTP, Rio Hondo. Yep. I'm also recognized as a early childhood education, education mentor teacher from the state of California. That's great because I, I continue to say, 
I'm not just stuck in one place. Mm -hmm. If I can do it and it's it, and it all works together, right? It's right. not that I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm going from education to something else. It's all the craft that I've been blessed to have. It's about refining it and sharing it so other people can see that and say, you know what? Hey, Jorge's not that bad after. He's actually yeah. pretty good. So it, let's share what we know about education. That's awesome. Let me ask you this, and do we have time for this? Because I know that you have yeah. to pick up your kid a little bit. Okay, no. because you talk about sort of the, um, because it's about make being financially successful is about sort of growth and networking, like you said earlier. Do you think part of it also has to do with our culture as men? Because I was speaking with another group re earlier this week, and what one person pointed out was the only reason I think some of us as minorities are successful in education is because as minorities, we have to work twice as hard to get half as much. And one of my colleagues said, a lot of us do a lot of different things because we're given so few opportunities, so we have to always keep looking forward to just be well off because there are some people in our field who just who are textbook teachers, who just teach the curriculum and then go home, or just do this as a side hustle. Do you think that from your success, do you think it's some part based on your culture, like your masculine culture and your uh, and your ethnic culture of coming from Mexico? A lot has to do with that. Um, being Mexican, to be able to say that, hey, you know what, I have a grad studies degree from one of the most um, prestigious universities, it's a big deal. Um, to me, honestly, I, and I hear you say the word success, I kind of cringe at it because to myself, I, I, I'm still... Far away from. Oh that. yeah, I feel the I feel the exact same way. I am never happy about my job. I'm right. always looking for the next thing. Yeah, exactly. And, and and that's the mentality that was given to me by my dad. Mm -hmm. He he pushed that on all of us. And you know, don't matter doesn't matter where you're at, you can always keep getting better. And I think that that's the culture that needs to be instilled. It's you're not you shouldn't just be content with where you're at now. You want to continue to strive better. You should continue to to get better. Um, a lot of the success that people want to live up to is based on. Com they compare themselves to something that's unrealistic. You know, I want, I want my bank account to match Tom Brady's. Yeah, well, good luck, right? Yeah. <laughs> I but rather to say, you know what, I'm going to be the best Jorge that I can. I understand where I came from. I know my struggles. But I can get better if I choose to get better. We should never feel that, you know what, this is good enough, especially with education, especially with children. It's a matter of I have the platform to empower young children, to empower other people, to continue to get better, to give back to society so we can get better, and then we can repeat that cycle of success with, within any culture that we want. You know, we talk about inclusive, uh, being inclusive, we talk about um, we're a melting pot. Sometimes that's not seen, but if we have that platform now, we can start doing that. You know, we're, we're the leaders, so let's, let's start doing that. Let's start showing everybody else what we can do. And I, I think culture has a lot of influence into what success is, um, but we define success. That's, oh, that's a good point. Man, you got a lot of mic drop moments. <laughs> damn, you're a good educator. No, it's good, I yeah. I was half I mean, as I, good as this. Man, you say good thing. I'm like, damn, I feel inspired. I think it's, I think it's <laughs> like, one of those situations where you say um, we define success, but once we define that success, right, then we're full. You know, once we sit back and we say, I'm successful then we've lost that hunger, that drive, right? right? So you kind of want to keep that to constantly be moving forward. Because like yourself, right, you might look at the resume and say, wow, you've accomplished a lot. And then you see internally you're saying, no, I still have a lot more right. to go, right? And that's kind of, I think, where the three of us are in the sense of, you know, on paper we probably look pretty cool, right? Probably look amazing, especially for where we come from, right? right. But uh, we still desire more, right? And we still crave more because we know what's to come. And for you, your, you know, your, it's your legacy, right? The next generation right. coming up. I often look at my son and I think he, he tells me all the time, he's like, uh, he already knows, right? He's in the first grade. He already knows that high school is not the end all, right? So right now our goal is like Stanford, right? And so then he goes, well, that means I have to get my PhD because you only got your master's. I'm like, that's right. Damn. That's exactly what that means, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm not going to do it. You can do that. <laughs> I, I appreciate that mentality, and that's, yeah. uh, as a mentor, that's what I tell my mentees. When when they do say, like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we're doing a resume, can I see yours? And it's like, oh, yeah. you know, I feel very self-conscious about sharing my resume. So, and it's the same thing, as mm -hmm. you said, like, oh, my gosh, you've done this. Like, look, my goal for you is to get beyond where I'm Yes. At. And, and that's, yeah. that's social, that's um, cultural change. That's social change that I want to be able to impact. 
you can get, the, I got in here wherever you're going to define that is. But for me, my goal for you is to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. And it's doing so with a, a genuine perspective where right. it's like, you know, this is complete altruism, right? I'm not trying to, you know, hinder you in any way. I want to help you, right? Help you get there. And I think often because of the society that we come from, right, this is a kind of individualistic culture, it's hard for us to view things in a collectivistic way where it's like it's about the group. It's about right. us coming right. together and succeeding together because if you succeed, then we all succeed, right? right? Yeah. And I think that's the most important takeaway. Yeah. And it's just as important to find people that are willing to give you that opportunity. Yeah. You know, to find someone that genuinely wants to help you get better. It's, it, it can be a challenge. I, I didn't have any mentors growing up. It, was, it wasn't until I was, um, oh, 2011, I, my first mentor, Manu Caldera, who really, come here. Okay, we need to talk. Is that how it works, yeah. right? Yeah. Because my mine was Daniel Lind, and I was uh, I was in a classroom, ethnic studies, and it was the same thing. I was trying to leave. I left my stuff on the table, so I was the last one to leave the classroom. And he said, "No, come here." Yeah. And we ended up talking for about forty minutes. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, oh. right. And it's like you know, I gotta go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Two hours later into this conversation, is that is, you know you're driving home, reflecting. It's like yeah. that was deep. You know, I I want to have those moments with with my mentee, so they can say, you know what, hey. Jorge really, man, he's crazy and all. He has a weird way of thinking, <laughs> but he makes sense into what I want. Just yesterday, I got a, 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 a phone conversation with one of my students from Cal State LA, and um, she's a dreamer, and she's about to graduate, and she's feeling like if the resources are running out. And it's like, wait a minute, no. Have you have we looked at this? Have we considered that? And what about this? What about... And she's like, oh, my God. It was 20 minutes later. She's like, I just feel... Like, I'm ready to go take on the world now. Will you do that? Yeah. Uh, and and, <laughs> and awesome. as we hung up, I'm just like, wow, that felt so good. You yeah. Know? And, and it, there, there is, this is the part of the career where there is no financial compensation. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be recognized. But to genuinely do that, to help someone else get better, mm -hmm. that just makes it all worth it. Yeah. And on that note, for those of you who are listening, if you're interested, again, Jorge Ramirez is a mentor in the CPTP, the Community Partnership for Teachers Pipeline. It is a national program. The programs that we have in Los Angeles are at Rio Hondo College, Cerritos College, and El Camino College. So if any of you are interested, please make sure to look up CPTP or look up any teacher preparation program at your local college. Jorge, right, before you go, do you have any piece of advice for those people who may have been inspired by everything you just said, what is the one thing you want to leave them with? Never lose faith and always fight on. Jorge, thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time, Jorge. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Hi, my name is Isaac Medrano, a student here at Rio Honda College, and I've captured the passion. Hey, everyone. I'm excited to tell you about an all-new education podcast. I'm the host, Alex Dijon, and in each episode, I will talk with inspiring and thought-provoking guests to stimulate your mind and to give you a greater understanding of the power and potential education has for not only students, but as a career option. Hopefully, each episode will also give you a glimpse of what it takes to be a great educator, and together, we'll capture the passion. Listen and follow along on YouTube, iTeach, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcasts. Man, that was one heck of a guest we had on today, huh, Mr. Dijon? Absolutely. Like, Jorge Ramirez was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Jorge, for being here. Yes, Jorge. And for talking about your own experiences growing up in L.A. as being a student and also how your experiences shaped you to be the fantastic teacher that you are right now. You know, one of the things I loved about our conversation with Jorge was that uh, he really empowers his name, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that more of us need to do that, right? Yeah, I just go by Alex because I got to tired of like all the teachers going alex andre like it's alexander looks like alex andre all right just alex yeah it was with me it's my last name all right they'd say siberio sabario Siber and then say, yeah and i would just say siberio and that's me acquiescing to them right mm -hmm. because it's siberio so from now on thank you jorge it's siberio i will not accept anything less siberio and you can just keep calling me alex <laughs> <laughs> what's coming up next week alex so next week we're going to keep talking about the concept of idea inclusivity diversity equity and access in particular though we're going to focus on equity and access and how it relates to special education with that said 
Don't forget to thank your podcast team, please. I want to thank all of our crew here at Capture the Passion. I want to thank Leah Martinez, the executive director of the CPTP program at Rio Hondo College. I also want to thank Brianna Reyes, our social media director and occasional guest. I'd also like to thank our audio engineer and co-host, Eric Sibirio, and I guess myself for being here. I Good guess. try, me. I guess. Without you and everyone else, none of this is possible. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please remember to follow us on social media. Remember that you can catch the podcast anywhere podcasts are pretty much heard. We are global. Uh, And stay tuned next week because like we just went over, it's going to be all about equity and access on Capture the Passion. Capture the Passion.